Since here on New Dimensions, so many of our guests and topics are products of the 60s, the embryonic decade for so many of the issues and concerns we take for granted today, we thought it appropriate to bring to our microphones one of the charismatic figures of that time. In mid-1983, his autobiography was published, part revelation, part social history, part philosophy, flashbacks is the title, and Timothy Leary is the author. Whatever one's feelings are about Timothy Leary, his societal impact has been undeniable. A symbol of change and self-discovery for an entire generation, Leary's story is a reflective history of our times. Join us for the next hour as we explore the enthralling, provocative, and challenging story of Tim Leary. My name is Michael Toms. I'll be your host. Timothy, welcome. Michael, happy to be here. I'd like to enter a time machine, uh, if we will, uh, and go back 20 years, go back to Harvard, and uh, if you can put yourself back in that place. I'm wondering, at that time, what was your vision of the future? What did you see, what you were doing then? Did you see it taking... Uh, where did you see it going? What was your future uh, idea of its direction, the work you were doing? I think that uh, from the very, very beginning of our psychedelic drug research at Harvard, we knew that uh, we were on the verge of something very big. We knew that uh, human intelligence and human virtue had reached a point where uh, we would be able to... Uh, learn more about the brain and activate it. Um, the, uh, of course, those of us at Harvard, uh, Richard Alpert, Baba Ramdas, uh, Ralph Metzner, the, the large group that assembled there, were not the pioneers, the, uh, the, the people that were teaching us about consciousness, expanding drugs, were people like Aldous Huxley, Alan Watts, even uh, Henry Luce, the respectable conservative uh, founder of Time Magazine, there was a, a large group of uh, thoughtful people who told us that uh, the doors of perception were going to open and an avalanche of uh, change would happen. So we, there was never any doubt in our minds that uh, we, we were mem members of, a, of an old profession, and this happened before, it happened in the uh, 1830s, it was a transcendental movement, which again started at Harvard, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, the first great uh, uh, woman uh, transcendentalist. That explosive uh, movement in, of, of uh, Brook Farm, uh, but of course it goes way back. Uh, if you want to take the time tunnel, uh, the the concepts that we were working with, which is altered states, uh, consciousness expansion, increased intelligence, uh, finding divinity and finding illumination, revelation within, it, it goes back uh, throughout human history. So we were, with the aid of people like Alan Watson and Aldous Huxley, we were we were pretty clear that we were uh, and certain that we were. Uh, riding a Niagara wave. Well, what happened with respect to the institution uh, in the sense, I mean, did you become too successful and suddenly it wasn't appropriate to to be a part of the institution anymore? Or did you, or was it a, somehow somehow become threatening all of a sudden? What, what took place there when uh, Harvard essentially uh, asked you to leave and you departed? It, it became clear to us that uh, the sort of research we were doing which involved uh, radically different ways of approaching the brain and the mind uh, couldn't and shouldn't be done in a prestigious, respectable, highly um, uh, establishment organization like Harvard University. So uh, actually uh, several weeks before uh, Richard and I were fired, I had left Harvard. I'd turned in my... Uh, my uh, time clock and uh, had, had headed for uh, Mexico where we'd started uh, a training center. We knew that we shouldn't be at Harvard and we had no, uh, and never have had any uh, grudges about Harvard. Goodness, uh, Harvard is there to uh, train Ivy Leaguers to go to Washington and Wall Street and, <laughs> and keep the WASP establishment going. They're supposed to be turning out new Buddhas and <laughs> a new brand of science fiction uh, neuronauts. <laughs> So it was just sort of a natural thing. Yes, we, uh, there, was, uh, uh, there was a little drama v involved in it. Uh, as I, in flashbacks, I mentioned some of the um, minor political 
squabbling. There was a a professor there named Herbert Kelman who kind of led an attack on us and uh, turned out later that he was uh, a beneficiary of CIA funding. He says he wasn't witting, but that doesn't make any difference. The CIA knew they had a good sound fellow there that uh, should be rewarded. So that uh, they were, they were political issues, uh, but they're secondary. They're kind of uh, gossipy. But they're real. we didn't belong at Harvard, and uh, we uh, we set up our own institutions. That uh, throughout history, that's been true. You know, Freud couldn't get uh, a job in a Viennese hospital, and. Uh, Socrates got uh, <laughs> put in the put in the last cell in the back row and uh, of death row, and uh, Voltaire had to head it on the lamb. Uh, the long we were pretty much aware. Uh, I think all of us uh, at the Harvard Psychological Group, and, and that included about thirty-five of us, uh, people like Professor Walter Clark, who was a very distinguished, gray, ultra respectable uh, theologian. The younger uh, psychologists do. They knew they were risking their careers. They knew that they were uh, maybe going to put themselves out a little too far and never be able to get back. But uh, they, we had a, we, we always had a sense of history. Allen Ginsberg. I, I have a chapter in flashbacks about Allen Ginsberg coming to Harvard. And Allen and uh, people like Kerouac and Burroughs taught us a great deal too. They had the street wisdom that we lacked, uh, being Ivy League Harvard professors. And Allen Ginsberg, uh, whatever you think of his poetry is a very effective um, literary social worker. He's like a, 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 a cosmic defense attorney for uh, beatniks and romantics and uh, bohemians and hippies and hipsters, no matter what name you give them. The, uh, the, the group in every culture throughout history that have carried on the message of individuality, look within, irreverence to authority, question authority, uh, try something new. Ginsburg was uh, very aware. Ginsburg told me, and I, I've, I've thought about it almost every week since then, that uh, we were part of the of the Bohemian tradition or of the avant-garde tradition that uh, had always existed. And he, he felt that um, our group included Gary Snyder, it included uh, Ken Kesey. He saw us as, as as important historically as Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. Uh, and uh, we're a young country, and you, we've only been going 200 years. And I think when the history of our times is written, you're you're never going to hear the names of Nixon or Kissinger or MacArthur, or you know, the you may maybe some mention of Roosevelt, maybe Kennedy because of the of the assassination of the romance. But the uh, Allen told us, and and I believe him, and I'll repeat it today that I think that the history of, of America is going to be the history of people like Emerson, uh, Thoreau, uh, Jefferson as a philosopher. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, my God, that poor man was, you know, was uh, savaged by the media and uh, pushed around by the establishment. Uh, Mark Twain, who was a tremendous outcast, even though he was very popular. The history of America is the history of those of us that belong to this uh, this uh, wonderful brotherhood and sisterhood of uh, avant-garde uh, inner voyagers that we, we, we believe uh, that we're the American tradition. And uh, so we weren't really that surprised when the, the thing exploded in the 60s. We, we, that's what we had signed up for. I recall something in the book you mentioned about Aldous Huxley, and I believe there was somebody else whose name I can't recall, and Aldous was saying that uh, he thought you were a little too conservative uh, in your approach. <laughs> yes, that uh, uh, Humphrey Osmond. That's it, the, Humphrey the, Osmond. The brilliant yeah. uh, British psychiatrist who invented the word psychedelic had been conspiring with uh, Huxley, and the two of them came to Harvard, and they kind of checked me out, and uh, they they were hoping that we would do pretty much what we did. But I think <laughs> we probably carried a little too far, or, or events carried all of us farther than we expected. But uh, Huxley uh, and Osmond, after the dinner with me, went, well, he's a nice guy, but he's a little too straight, and uh, maybe we can loosen him up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you mentioned Allen Ginsberg. He had this idea of uh, traipsing off to New York on weekends and turning on uh, as many of uh, his associates and friends as possible. And there were some fascinating stories that you were related in the book about those kind of those experiences. Well, as I say, Alan has always been a, pol a politician, a cosmic politician. He was the first person to point out to me the uh, insanity and cruelty of the drug laws, the treating uh, people as criminals for uh, trying to alter their conscience. He was a a tremendous crusader and always has been anytime anyone was in jail God knows how many times Alan bailed me out or got uh, signatures and petitions to help me out of the various uh, 
dungeons that the uh, establishment put me in. So uh, Alan uh, said that our strategy should be uh, one of uh, turning on important people in uh, literature and poetry, art, uh, music. So uh, he had, I remember it was about 21 years ago today in my uh, dining room, he pulled out his battered leather uh, address book and there in his tiny little Ginsburg scrawl he had the names and addresses and phone numbers of the who's who of American art. Uh, and then he'd give me a ring and uh, uh, in the middle of the week and I'd go down <laughs> Uh, from Logan Airport on the Boston to New York shuttle with uh, my little bag full of psilocybin pills. And Peter Lusky and Alan and I would uh, go around uh, uh, New York uh, turning on uh, uh, famous, distinguished, uh, successful uh, people in the arts. The, the idea was that if we turned them on, they could tell us what they experienced because we were novices. They could in turn uh, uh, teach other people uh, about this and uh, we thought that... Um, the, um, the movement would grow that way, and certainly did. Timothy, if you were back in the 60s now, would you do anything differently than you did then? Oh, Michael, it's, uh, that's, of course, the big if question. Wouldn't we all do it differently if we could do it? You know, if you go back to your senior prom, it would, uh, um, I've, I've given this a great deal of thought, and I've been asked that question many times. Uh, Basically, we were out there doing our best uh, on a frontier that had never been explored before. Our, our hearts were pure, and we, uh, we the, I think we, on the big issues, uh, we always did the right thing. One thing I kind of regret is that uh, we were a little blind. I didn't understand the importance of the new generation. I didn't realize demography, that there were 76 million kids born between the years 46, that's post Hiroshima, and 1964, double the birth rate, 40 million more than we expected. Now the impact uh, of doubling a birth rate in a country like America is, is simply enormous. And of course this generation was not only different in size, it was different uh, in their basic reality imprints with, as parents of this generation. We, you know, it was Dr. Spock, it was demand feeding, it was treat them equals, treat them as individuals, don't force them into, that had never been done before to kids, that's almost unheard of. And when the right-wing reactionary and left-wing reactionary people uh, later on blamed Dr. Spock, you know, of some, they were right. It was, of course, Dr. Spock was simply a, a vehicle, a, a, an instrument for genetic history unfolding. But this, we, we hot shots at Harvard and we, philosophy, PhDs, really didn't understand that this generation was going to sweep through American culture like a, a tsunami wave, changing everything, including us, and it just swept us right out of Harvard, and it swept us right out of any illusions we might have had of slow change. Uh, I, I think that uh, if we'd caught on to this quicker, uh, we probably would have warned people in the late 60s that the LSD they were getting was not pure and that there was a deliberate government conspiracy to kind of, uh, you know, um, cloud up uh, and, and put out really dangerous drugs. I think that we, we, uh, we, we didn't understand the enormity of implications of the baby boom. And um, I, I personally now feel that uh, the concept of generation, the generation you belong to, uh, is one of the most important things in your life because you're going to be swimming like a school of fish in this school of your own generation. And the kids that came up in the in the 60s, hit high school and college in the 60s and early 70s, share basic reality imprints that uh, are entirely different from Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill and, and even Teddy Kennedy. And uh, the, uh, the reason that the importance of, of generation, generational demographics, demor demor generational psychology, uh, we didn't, the reason we didn't understand it was because there had never in history been such a quick generational change of that import and that numbers uh, of the baby womb. So in hindsight, if I knew then what I know now, I probably would have done something differently, but, but you can't... Um, what about your... Uh perception of the establishment. I mean, in some sense, in talking about being out on the edge, you were out on the farthest edge, and have you ever thought that perhaps you took the rap for a lot of other people? Since, I mean, you got nailed and many other people didn't. 
Well, uh, I was very aware of that, and I think um, most thoughtful people were aware of that. In the uh, after uh, Nixon came into power in 1968, uh, it's obvious he couldn't do anything about young people and the counterculture and drugs. But one thing he could do would be, and he said it uh, in so many words, "We can imprison the spokesman." So I knew that uh, I was a uh, like a lightning rod. I knew that I was uh, like a symbol. And uh, I accepted this. Uh, it, it's reality, and uh, you can't complain about it, or you can't uh, cry foul. That's the way the ball game is played, and uh, that's why I've never felt any resentment or bitterness. As a matter of fact, I'm rather honored. Uh, you know, I was put in the penalty box for, in the great cosmic hockey game for four <laughs> years. Well, the, the, they they put in the penalty box the people they think are more, most dangerous to them, and in a sense, it's flattering. So. Uh, um, do you think, in, in, in reflecting on that experience, that, that the establishment learned anything from their experience with you? And if so, what? No, the establishment never learns anything. Uh, they start, well, they start Vietnam again, uh, as they're trying to do in Central America. Vietnam was, of course, the Korean War. Uh, they, they, they never learn anything. They were always fighting the, the last war because you can't learn. Uh, you, once you've been imprinted in... in, in um, in adolescence, unless you deliberately try to uh, re-imprint and change, you, you, you can't learn. You're simply going to repeat the same uh, reactions because you're living in the same reality. Um, Tip O'Neill in, in, in Ronald Reagan's uh, 60s was Teddy Roosevelt running around storming Cuba and running down with a big stick in the Caribbean and shaking his fist at Nicaragua and stealing the Panama Canal away from, from the country of Colombia. So that uh, no, they 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 still see the world in those terms, and uh, they uh, they can't be expected to to change. And, and I'm not being uh, I'm not being hostile here. It's a straight neurological fact we're talking about. What allows some people to re-imprint and change, and others not? Well, that's a good question. I think uh, uh, where you hang out uh, is very important. Uh, I think the people that you associate with. The problem with with Ronald Reagan right now is that he probably spends less than two or three percent of his time with uh, kids under the age of uh, eighteen. He simply never hangs out with them, and if he does, it's not in any sense of learning from them, you know, to perform. So I say really zero. He's getting no input from uh, from the whiz kids. I think he spends almost no time with baby boomers. Those now between the age of eighteen and thirty six. He may see them occasionally, but it's to give a speech at a you know. A, a, at an organization, but to really sit down, hang out, listen, absorb, learn, exchange, interface, uh, you know, get it on with, and that the only way you can learn, these people don't, uh, and they get trapped in their um, their realities, and uh, of course it's through the Soviet people that run the Soviet Union and China too, look at their faces, they, uh, uh, it's so simple too, if you want to change, uh, it's just uh, it's geography. Just just move to the place where uh, different people hang out and listen. And uh, uh, right now, I spend um, I spend about uh, oh sixty percent of my time with with people between the ages of eighteen and thirty six. My wife comes from this group, and most of our friends are. I spend about twenty percent, maybe twenty five percent of my time with uh, kids born after sixty four. This is my nine year old son, my ten year old granddaughter, my eleven year old grandson. I hang out, you know, listening to them, playing computers with them, and uh, I spend less than 10% of my time with people um, of my own generation. Uh, I can play, I, I see uh, very clearly that the age of the people you hang out with determines your age, and it's possible just as we, you have geographical units like uh, continents like Asia and Africa and Ireland, Generations are are, are are temporal units, and you can jump generations. You can migrate. And how do you migrate from one generation to another? It's, it's time travel. Just hang out uh, with people of different ages. And, and I like to take trips way back to uh, way back to the 1920s. Uh, I can talk World War II. I can talk alcohol prohibition with the old-timers, and I love to do it, but not more than 10% of the time. You know, we, we heard about the, the uh, 60s being the... Um, revolutionary generation, or the revolutionary decade, and the '70s being the me decade. And what do you think is the legacy of the '60s? Because most of that really is media hype. I mean, it's really not an accurate reflection of what happened. Well, I think it's a um, 
it's a mistake to focus on the, uh, the, the decade. You must keep your eye on that generation, the baby boom generation, those born between the years 1946 and 64, the late 60s and early 70s, was their adolescence. So it was romantic, idealistic. Uh, they wanted to shake up and change sexual mores, music, art, uh, uh, lifestyle, uh, you name it. Uh, anything in the broad spectrum of American culture was changed by these kids then. Now, the 70s was a period when they were settling down into graduate school. They were getting, or they were settling down to careers. They were having families. Uh, the 80s, uh, or the uh, uh, period when this group is getting to a position where they're going to take over. You see, in 1988, there'll be an election then, I hope. The baby boomers, 76 million of them, will be between the ages of 24 and 42. So we're talking here about this generation is basically a 21st century generation. And instead of using the term baby boom, I sometimes prefer to use the concept the 21st century generation because at the turn of the century, the baby boomers are between the ages of... Uh, 36 and 54. They'll have the, it's their generations. It's their, this their century. They're not really of this century. So they're going to, in the future, step by step, they're going to take over. And I tell you, they are different and they're going to make uh, America a different uh, and a much better country. Do you think uh, psychedelics are necessary for change, for people to change, to re imprint, as it were? Yes, I, I, I think that uh, now, this period, um, I, I would be amazed if anyone would explain to me how they can really change the neurological imprint without uh, using uh, you know, the, the organic chemicals that are... See, a drug that changes your brain is an access code, like the, that, those circuits of your computer. They, uh, drugs inter, interface or interconnect or, or unlock uh, receptor sites in the brain. Now, there are, there are other ways of doing this. Uh, uh, Dr. Patterson apparently has developed this electrical way of setting up vibrations to, uh, to uh, set off endorphins and so forth. I'm sure that in the future we will, we will uh, have uh, other ways of doing this the, uh, and the Buddhists would say they have other ways of doing it, for example. Good for them, good for them. Yeah. Uh, there's no, um, there's um, really no cause for debate here. Uh, anyone who really, uh, if you think of the endpoints that you want to get to, and then anything that'll get you there, is, 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 it's your style and your way of doing it. Uh, In some uh, sense, if one looks at other cultures and other societies, uh, particularly um, more societies that would fit the definition of primitive, primitive um, or perhaps using the word primal um, and not using primitive in the sense that it's ordinarily used as being backwards or not uh, civilized or whatever. But if one looks at primitive societies, one notices that frequently they have ritualized uh, events in their lives where they use um, natural drugs to uh, change their consciousness in order to deal with various aspects of their life. And in this society, we don't seem to have any such ritual other than perhaps the stand-up cocktail party, and not much more than that. Well, it is interesting how alcohol has got so much ritual. You know, you walk into a bar room at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the afternoon, it's like a, a cathedral with the glass and the bottles and the lights and the, the priest is the bartender with white uniform and the clinks and the, and the laughter and the, the, the merriment of people who have just gotten off work and want to flirt or want to relax. It's an incredibly powerful ritual. It has nothing to do with alcohol, uh, by the way. I want to continue this in just yeah. one moment. I'm speaking with Timothy Leary, author of Flashbacks. We'll be right back. You're listening to New Dimensions. Since 1973, New Dimensions Radio has brought listeners in touch with innovators and ideas on the leading edge of change. Another way these thought-provoking voices and visions can be heard is through audio cassette tapes. More than 800 programs are available. For a free listing of some of the most popular New Dimensions audio adventures on cassette tape, write New Dimensions Radio.
San Francisco, California, 94114. That address again is New Dimensions Radio, Department K, 267 States Street, San Francisco, California, 94114. And now, back to our program. Well, Timothy, you were describing the uh, cathedral-like atmosphere of the uh, normal bar situation. Yes, and I was responding to your question about um, the use of drugs in different societies, primal societies. One, one, I hesitated when you asked me about, oh, did I think drugs were necessary, and kind of paused for for this reason. You, You have to ask about any consciousness altering technique what's the goal instead of talking about this form of meditation or that or this drug or that what are you, what are you trying to get uh, what is the, the end state because after all it's not the drug or the technique although we quarrel and imprison each other and uh, divide up and, uh, and debate over the, the technique issue the, the, the basic issue is where do we want to get and I don't think we can discuss consciousness or drugs uh, at this moment in world history without realizing that we are changing from an industrial society to an information society and uh, the awesome implications of this and obviously uh, the, the the use of drugs the fact that um, you know in America today 90 billion dollars is spent on, on illegal drugs alone 90 billion dollars that's that's like 20 times more than the entire output of Hollywood in a year uh, uh, and that's just illegal drugs. That doesn't include uh, the, the legal drugs like alcohol and nicotine and uh, and prescription drugs. Uh, it's a, the reason for this is not that society is going to hell or that it's the fall of the Roman Empire. It's we're moving into an information society when a communication and when neurological uh, uh, input-output and expansion of, uh, of receptors and in, uh, better techniques of of storing and transmitting information. These are the, uh, the real issues. And naturally, uh, drugs which alter consciousness, which, which uh, change your processing of information, are going to be more part of life uh, than in, a, uh, in, industrial so- in an industrial society. You couldn't possibly have a big drug movement which involved individual search or individual uh, personal development. Why? Because everyone had to be there at the factory at 8 o'clock when that whistle went off and you had to work right on your job until 5 and you had to punch that clock and you had to be dependable, reliable, replaceable, conforming. Now, you you couldn't have a a personal growth, internal introspection, meditation, psychedelic uh, type movement in in an industrial society. So what we call the 60s and the me generation, uh, the self development personal growth movement of the of the 70s and the and the, to me the, the 80s are kind of like the the really hip sophisticated hipster generation i think i do a lot of lecturing uh, michael at colleges and i talk you know to young people i listen to them and they're not conservative uh, they're, they're basically realistic i think they're very sophisticated and i think they they, they understand the 60s they understand the 70s and they're not uh, waving flags but i think that they're basically uh, you know, they've got a certain um, cynical, tolerant, amused wisdom here that uh, that uh, I think is going to be um, quite appropriate for the information society that we're generating. And I must say at this point that the, the use of, of brain change drugs or of conscious altering techniques has got to be uh, tied in to the use of computers. I've been working with with and around computers and computer people for the last uh, two years and uh, I'm, I'm not the first person to say this it's almost a cliche but computers are the 80s what uh, brain change drugs were the 60s and early 70s they and you know you talk to people and they say well I use a computer to cause it saves time or because it's more efficient that's not the issue a computer is a an ex- extension of the human brain and you can program computers I'm, I'm working now with a group uh, that are con- programming computers to, to think like selves. So the, the, you'd have a program which would have a personality, and uh, it, we're, tra- we're, we're trying to program computers to evolve and to, to grow. And if we can train a computer to do that, then of course uh, uh, it's going to be uh, a lot 
more respectable and a lot easier for the whole society to uh, accept these concepts of uh, of personal growth and uh, development. And program and computers so that we don't need ourselves anymore. That's the question. See, the use of uh, humanots, that's uh, advanced compu- artificial intelligence computers and robots, raises the question, you know, we don't need human beings to work anymore. Matter of fact, work... Is a should be stricken from our vocabulary. In a sense, work is slavery. Work is something that you have to do. Now, any work that you have to do that can be done better by a machine, of course, is humiliating. But the question is, if computers and robots can help us evolve and grow, what do we need? What are humans for? Isn't that wonderful? Finally, we're not here to to uh, to fight communism. We're not here to 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 fight for a job. We don't do that anymore. What are we for? Well, the answer to that is. The function of the human being is to evolve, to grow, to become more intelligent, to uh, to become uh, a, a, a more advanced uh, form of, uh, of our species. And it's exactly that moment when, when computers and robots are teaching us, are acting as catalysts to uh, to uh, to stimulate us to uh, make the next evolutionary move. It's, it's, uh, I go around now and I watch everything's being done by human beings. Could this be a do- done better by a by a Highly, you know, an artificial intelligent robot, and the embarrassing answer is ninety percent of the of the times you're you're having some trouble with a clerk or a reservations clerk or or uh, whatever it is, or uh, the job could be done more efficiently. That leads me to a question I'd like to ask you, Timothy, particularly with the emergence of the computer in the '80s and the technology that allows us to have this incredible abundance of information. Um, we have this paradox of this abundant information and informational sources, and we have this shortage of wisdom, yep. as you just pointed out in the fact that frequently we have human beings could perhaps their jobs could be better done by robots, mostly because uh, there isn't an appropriate application of wisdom mm-hmm. in the process of interacting with people. What about that paradox? Are computers going to give us wisdom? Yeah. Uh, y- you can... You could buy a probably within five years, three years, maybe two years, you'll be able to buy a wisdom program it's like Pac-Man. It probably cost thirty-five, thirty-nine dollars. <laughs> It'd be the wisdom program. Teach you how to be wise, and it would uh, stimulate you. And uh, you could you could uh, play games with it. And any time you slid off and started to be uh, unwise, the, the computer would say, "Oh no, no, no! Come on now, you're supposed to be wise." This is, oh yeah. Uh, uh, there is this paradox, but I think we must be very kind to each other. We are, we're involved in such an accelerated uh, rate of revolution right now, and things are happening so quickly. My goodness, every five years there's a, almost a new wave of, um, of innovation that's happening. And uh, Five years is more like five weeks. I, I agree. <laughs> it ate at the truth, I know. So that, uh, now, the problem is, of course, that the men, and I use the, the male gender here quite uh, precisely, the, the men who are running America go back. They're, they're the coal warriors, they're the hawks, they're the people who were imprinted uh, before 1946. They still believe in American Legion, they still believe in empire, they still believe in guns. and uh, Peace they, through strength, I think. Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, they are still in charge and will remain in charge for the next two or s- perhaps six years. And uh, the last thing in the world they're interested in is an increase in intelligence or increase in wisdom. Uh, but uh, they'll be phasing out very quickly and... Uh, uh, I, I may be overly optimistic, but I believe that the younger generation, those be- now but be- you know, born between forty six and sixty four, are going to uh, make a difference. They do think differently. And if I'm optimistic, and if I'm wrong, I'm going to go around the country and I'm going to talk to several million people in the next uh, two or three years, saying exactly this message: seventy six million of you, you've got to be different. You, you, you simply uh, have the have the numerical power, and I'm going to make it happen. If I have to do it. <laughs> well, we're fond of saying around here that optimism is a biological necessity. Oh boy, yeah. The word optimism, very interesting. It comes from the Latin op- optimus, which means you know, um, the best. And pes- pessimist is the w- comes from the, w- the Latin word uh, pessimi, pessimist, uh, which means worst. And so uh, the, uh, we, the, we've simply got to demand uh, the best uh, from ourselves and from each other. Timothy, I'd be interested in your uh, perception of uh, what you see taking place now. It seems that we're living in uh, highly reactionary times, and it's almost uh, um, as if uh, there's this... Hell, uh, headlong rush to return to the past. Uh, there's a 
popularity of of uh, nostalgia and um, it should be like the 50s again and what about that what do you think's going on well I think that in anything you say about uh, humanity at this point should precisely indicate the um, age group and the geographical location uh, it is true that um, in places like Washington, D.C., uh, there's a great deal of looking backward on the part of both the Republicans who want us to take, it, to take us back to a real glorious, wonderful war, uh, or the Democrats who want to somehow get back to the New Deal. And, and uh, there's, on the other hand, uh, there's an enormous amount of, uh, of fresh, new, futuristic uh, thinking in this country. Uh, my travels have convinced me that, Michael, I think there are 20, maybe 30 million, maybe even more Americans who are reasonably enlightened. Now, they're not Buddhists, but they basically understand multiple reality. They basically have a sense of history. They have a sense of, uh, they're basically tolerant. They basically um, understand what not to do. And they're waiting for uh, something uh, that will... Uh, Harness. Uh, uh, maybe I'm concerned. Maybe. No, I think, well, SRI would agree with you. They've yeah. identified uh, 21 percent of the American population as being interdirected. Yeah, yeah, and 33 the Yank million adults. Yeah, the Yank Yankovic poll too uh, suggested uh, that uh, as high as 80 percent were partially involved in lifestyle and mm -hmm. personal growth. But uh, the the um, the popularity of movies like E.T. and War Games, which are totally um, Disrespectful of authority, and, and and young people's movies just uh, irreverent uh, to the the old ways. Uh, the computer movement, which uh, the the personal computer, the ability to have in your own home something that you can program, reprogram, means that uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, both of whom are you know acid heads or '60s kids, uh, have given us. Uh, re they wrenched away from the mainline IBM people this powerful tool and made it available. In the old days, most of us hated computers because we were being spindled and mutilated and cataloged and pushed around by them, but that's no longer possible. Indeed, uh, even IBM, the, the great Vatican of, uh, of, com of computerese, has given in now and is, is leading the way to uh, personal computers. This is important as the development of, uh, by Gutenberg of the printing press, which was a personal book before the Gutenberg there was one mainframe book in any town owned by the cardinal or the duke. There was the Bible, and nobody could use it except, uh, you know, the clerks or the hackers or the monks. So when Gutenberg allowed us to have the personal book, that meant we could, in our home, in our own home, we could read, and then we could start writing. We could start writing personal books and even recreational books. So the same thing was true with drugs in the 60s. The establishment had drugs, and then the idea of personal drugs and recreational drugs, that you could take it home and do what you wanted to. The computer is a, a continuation of this uh, evolutionary uh, uh, history, uh, something that uh, frees the individual to uh, to uh, program and reprogram and to uh, to get ahead of the system. So I, I'm citing here many reasons why I uh, I am optimistic. Although uh, I must agree that the Reagan administration is. Um, uh, represents a, a, an iron triangle of the military, uh, the Republican Party, and uh, the big industrial, particularly the weapons makers, who, who definitely run things, no question of it, the time, uh, life, and uh, Coca-Cola control Hollywood, they control the country. Uh, they even knocked out Ma Bell, wasn't it? We always thought Ma Bell owned this, but it uh, turns out it's uh, Lifetime and, uh, and Coca-Cola. So I, I, I have no illusions about the, uh, I, I feel the men uh, in this Iron Triangle, the Republican Party, the military, and the weapons people are, they belong to the Puritan strain. Uh, it came over, you know, in the first wave of, uh, from England. These men are tough-minded, they, they don't believe in life, they, they're predestinationists, basically, basically they think that the world is a terrible place, and there is an elect, and you have to be a, you know, belong to that wasp, and they don't care about the country, they don't care about humanity, they don't believe in evolution, basically, and they're mean, nasty, they hate play, they hate fun, they hate the idea of individual, you know, freedom. Uh, no, I have no illusions, uh, I'm not just preaching marshmallow fluff here, and, you know, take a joint and, and everything's going to be great, 
I think we have to be incredibly smart and we have to be incredibly effective in communicating. I'm communicating to more people, I think more effectively now than I was in the late 60s and 70s. I've got this book coming out. I, I think it's going to be a bestseller. God, the, 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 it's very clear the establishment hate my book. See, if if, if Time Magazine Time Magazine wouldn't review my book, they said they would, but they wouldn't. Now, that's really amazing. You, you see the stuff they review. And I finally understood why. They couldn't review that book because it's a good book about a good period, about a lot of good people doing a lot of good things. And if they were to say anything about that book, uh, you know, they, they want people to think that I'm brain damaged and I'm crazy and then my toasted head and uh, that, uh, blah, blah, blah. If, if they had to, to admit that the book was well written and it's about important events in human history, their whole edifice, their whole structure, their whole rally would, would have to change. And of course, they're not about to let that happen. So uh, I have no illusions about the, uh, the power of the, the men who are running things. And the Democrats, I, I'm giving hell to the Republicans here, but the Democrats are no help either. They're, they haven't come out with any new ideas. But uh, I, I think it's this collective intelligence that those who went through the 60s and 70s share. Uh, there's no easy answer, and I'm not here to, I'm not selling anything except individual intelligence, uh, collectively shared, the ability to really look at each other in the eye, and, and we're not going to be fooled again as uh, Peter Townsend sang. We're not going to follow leaders. We're going to watch our parking meters as Dylan sang. Uh, there's a tremendous heritage of intelligence and a tremendous. Uh, confidence that we that went through the 60s and 70s share and uh, when the time comes uh, the, I don't think there's going to be a leader either we're, we're beyond hierarchies and and messiahs uh, it's not going to be a swami or a holy person God help us uh, it's going to be networks it's going to be uh, local groups it's going to be communications it's going to be computer linkages it's going to be uh, the in interfaces that a communication society can set up it's going to be intelligence expressed and shared and uh, we're going to see that our, our task is to uh, activate and stimulate each other to grow and change and uh, uh, it's going to require a lot of intelligence it's not going to require work and struggle it's not those old political notions it's going to require sharp uh, sparkling eyed uh, uh, link up and uh, I, I believe it's going to happen Timothy a few years ago you were pretty hot on going beyond the planet space colonies so where are you with that now? Well, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that it's already happening. When I got out of prison in 1976, I went around in the first lecture circuit, and I was talking, I, I had invented the acronym SMILE, Space Migration, and Intelligence Increase, Life Extension. Well, intelligence increases, obviously, the computer, the neurological brain computer interface, which is happening, and which has totally changed my life. Uh, life Extension sounded pretty crazy when I was talking about it in 1976, but there have been two bestsellers, on life extension, and I think the very notion itself is now being accepted by uh, most uh, open-minded people. And space migration, you know, when I first started talking about space migration, space permanent space spaces, people looked at me and said, hey man, what are you smoking? I mean, give me some of that. I mean, those are funny hallucinations. But uh, uh, just about two weeks ago, uh, the Reagan administration announced that by 1990, they'd have a permanent space base. American. The Russians already had, are, are, are close to having one. Now, when this when this prospect uh, uh, first became uh, obvious, when this inevitability first became obvious to those of us in the space movement, we were a little worried because we knew that Reagan doesn't want to have a a uh, he doesn't want to have a resort colony up there. He doesn't want to have a university in the sky. He doesn't want to have a new frontier where people can go to try new experimental social forms. He wants weapons and he wants laser beam uh, uh, Star Wars uh, hardware. He wants the uh, military. But the nice thing about it is, the wonderful way in which I think genetic intelligence and uh, evolution works, by the time 1990 rolls around and we do have our permanent base up there, and they're going to try to fortify it by mining the asteroids and mining the moon, which we've been talking about. It sounded crazy when we said it, but now they need that fortification. <laughs> well, by 1990, Reagan will be out of office, uh, long gone. By 1990, there'll be a baby boom generation uh, woman, hopefully, as president, uh, certainly as vice president. We're going to have a totally new uh, deck of cards running things in, in, in 1990. So we will inherit the uh, space colonies up there, and we'll demilitarize them, and we'll use all that 
the, 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 the rocks and the sand from the asteroids to make beautiful beaches up there. The timing is working out uh, beautifully on space. It's coming right. It's no accident either that uh, there's such a big boom in space movies. Uh, you know, the kids uh, under the age of 15 spend more money, $7 billion a year, on video arcade space games than NASA and the Pentagon spend in the real hardware. Now, that's interesting, uh, but it's very, from those of us that believe in the future, that's wonderful because it means that uh, when these kids that are spending $7 billion now on these uh, hand eye coordination, brain uh, accelerating games, when, when they get in power, th they'll be happy to use their uh, tax dollars to, uh, to start new frontiers and new careers in space. So, um, so you think we're going to survive the uh, nuclear era? where we have this incredible proliferation of nuclear weapons, you think we're going to come through it unscathed? Um, well, who knows? I, I don't know any more uh, than anyone else. Uh, I have my own scenario. Number one, I believe that you've got to, you've got to think positively and you've got to do everything in your power to, um, to stop a nuclear. So I, I believe in nuclear activism. I believe in the freeze movement. I think that uh, we should all vote this year. Uh, I haven't voted in years. I'm going to register and my wife Barbara and I are going to vote. We're encouraging young people to vote because, uh, God, 76 million of you, you, you got the power. Uh, yes, I, I'm basically realistically and scientifically optimistic. I think if we can hold on till 1988, the, the baby boom generation will elect uh, officers an administration who should be realistic and will simply say to the rest, well, listen, we don't want to have the Cold War anymore. It's unrealistic to do that. And we'll do everything in our power to make the Soviet Union feel secure without, of course, disarming ourselves. We'll keep the concept of Spaceship America or Fortress America. I'll, I'll even buy that. But we're not we're going to pull back. We're not going to fight, fight you in Afghanistan. We're not going to surround you with all those. Uh, we're going to do everything in our power uh, realistically to make Russians feel secure. And we're going to tell the rest of the world we simply aren't going to go on with this insanity because the Cold War, the men that are running it, Reagan and Weinberger and uh, uh, Haig and Kissinger, you know, they are certifiably lunatic. They, they really have taken leave of their senses. They're out of touch with reality. They're playing out boys' locker room uh, games in their head that were, may have worked in, in, in World War II, but they're simply out of touch. And I think that a positive, tough-minded, realistic administration of young Americans to say the rest of the world, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to be patsies. We're not going to uh, uh, disarm. But uh, I think that would be such a refreshing voice and make the rest of the world waiting for America. Because most, you know, I've been around the world quite a bit uh, and I, I, since, I've, <laughs> since I got paroled uh, and uh, since I was able to leave the country, I've talked to a lot of European and Asian and African journalists, and uh, I tell you, you ask them flat out, is there any hope from, from Europe or Asia or Africa? And they'll say, hell no. The only hope in the world is still America because the only place where freedom and intelligence and individualism and, uh, uh, and immigration, we invite the smart people to come here, is the only place that's happening. It's not happening anyplace else. So, uh, yeah, these are my reasons for uh, optimism, but I'm an activist optimist and I'm out there uh, sending this signal out and uh, to as I say millions of people and that's why I wrote wrote this book I'm going to write other books I'm writing movies I'm very possible uh, transmitting a, a message of intelligent scientific uh, activist optimism boy that's a handful of uh, big words isn't it Tim I'd like to thank you for being with us today Michael, it's always a great pleasure. I really endorse what you're doing. It's uh, you're a very important voice in uh, the new dimensions and rallies we're working on, and a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. I've been speaking with Timothy Leary, author of Flashbacks, an autobiography. And if you're looking for a fantastic and humorous and wonderful uh, journey through the last 20 years, I invite you uh, to pick up a copy of the book. It's published in hardcover by Jeremy Tarcher. The title again, Flashbacks. My name is Michael Toms. On behalf of the entire New Dimensions Radio family, I'm wishing you well.
New Dimensions is produced by New Dimensions Radio, a nonprofit radio producer located in San Francisco. New Dimensions is made possible in part by listener contributions and by the members of Friends of New Dimensions. For more information about how you can participate in the New Dimensions Radio Network and to receive a free list of current New Dimensions tapes, please write New Dimensions Radio, Department K, 267 States Street, San Francisco, California, 94114. That address again, for information about the New Dimensions Radio Network and a free cassette tape listing, is New Dimensions Radio, Department K, 267 State Street, San Francisco, California, 94114. Or call us during normal business hours at 415-621-1126. Director of Broadcasting for New Dimensions is Phil Catalfo. Executive producer is Justine Toms. Associate producer is Tom Greenway. Your announcer is Dan Drayson. Thanks for listening, and have a wonderful week.